Hi, my name is Krista Wigrama Sacra, and if my last name has baffled you, trust me, you're not the first. I have two last names, Grund, which comes from my Polish-German mother, and Wigrama Sacra, from my Sri Lankan father. Now, based on these backgrounds, I identify as a person of Polish, German, and Sri Lankan descent, as well as a person of color. Now, a person of color in this specific example means someone who is not 100% of European descent and who has darker pigmented skin than someone who identifies as white. So as you can see, I come from a very diverse background, yet I'm just a small ingredient in this melting pot of a society. Now, as beautiful as it is to live in such a diverse world, it wasn't that way for me in the beginning. Now, I grew up in West Rogers Park, which is one of the most diverse communities in Chicago. All of my friends and all of their friends were different races. I mean, realistically, where are you going to find a Polish, German, Sri Lankan just waltzing around <laughs> other than my siblings, of course. So through my interactions with all of my friends, they taught me about their cultural traditions. And it was as though I was looking at their lives through their set of cultural glasses. My best friend, who is here tonight, is Greek Orthodox. And she taught me about her Easter tradition which began when I peered into an enclosed structure in her backyard to find an entire lamb being roasted on a spit. It's one of those images you can't quite get out of your head, no matter how hard you try. Um, my other friend is Indian, and she taught me about Holi and Diwali. And my Muslim friends taught me about Islam. Now, the reason why all my friends know about their cultures is primarily because their parents taught them. For me, other than the few Jewish traditions that my family did celebrate, because my mother's side of the family is Jewish, uh, other than those, I really, if you were to ask me, like, what is life like being a Polish, German, Sri Lankan, I wouldn't know what to tell you. Because if you asked me about that background, other than what I could find on a Google search or in a history book, I'm out. I don't have any information for you. So don't ask. And that was such a struggle for me because I viewed, I viewed not knowing my identity as such a big misfortune in my life because I couldn't take pride in who I was. Who did I represent? Where was I coming from? And I envied those people that had such a cultural connection. So it wasn't until I started growing up where I realized that I was cultivating a cultural tradition all along. It was my global foundation. Now, one of the many contributors to my culturally global foundation was my grandfather, Stephen Grund, who's also here tonight. <laughs> now, his first-hand accounts of living uh, as a young orphan in a time of war during World War II, trying to escape religious persecution, were my first glimpses of this world that I was just being brought into. And to be quite honest, it really posed some sort of confusion for me because I didn't see that world that way. The fact that people could do that to another person, was, it, it astounded me. And so that goes to show that the experiences that we have mold how we view the world. And when I thought about this as I started growing up, I realized the mechanisms that engendered this genocide. And it comes down to two distinct ideas, cultural awareness and communication. The minute we view each other as other, instead of actually individuals, we deepen the divides between each other. Just because someone has a different culture than you, that doesn't make them too complex to understand or too difficult. That doesn't mean you'll never find a common ground. No, that means you have to extend an arm and say, I want to have a conversation with you. Because humans ultimately are reservoirs of information that we can tap into. They have a perspective that will allow you to see the world in a way you may never have had the opportunity to see. So when I realized that very concept, I decided to make an effort in my life to stop absorbing the comments that people made around me and question them. Because the minute I questioned things, I was learning and so were they. And from there on, I expanded my cultural lexicon, allowing me to view the world so differently. So, when um, we start viewing the world differently, we can then take steps to involve ourselves in the situations going on around us. And thus, 
I realized that I, all along, was creating my own pair of cultural glasses. Now, this term, cultural glasses, I've thrown around a couple times. What does it mean exactly? I'll tell you what it means. This, this term was coined by Franz Boas, the father of modern American anthropology. He, he called this Kulturbrill, which comes from the German word. He says, this is a set of cultural glasses that each of us wears, lenses that provide us with the means for perceiving the world around us, for interpreting the meaning of our social lives and framing action into them. Now, this, the glasses that each of us has is based on the information and education that we've acquired thus far. So for me, not having a, a set of glasses prescribed for one, two, or three cultures allowed me to achieve a, gl a global cultural foundation. And this is not an exclusive opportunity. I mean, we all have that opportunity to go out and understand the world beyond what we already know. Another one of the many contributors to my cultural foundation is my mother, who's also here. <laughs> Um, she taught me how to be a good citizen and good person overall. Now, that doesn't mean that people who are deeply connected to their culture are bad citizens or bad people, but I do believe that only seeing the world from one culture or one perspective your entire life really discourages a global connection. I mean, sure, we can surround ourselves with people that look and act and behave like we do, and that provides a familiar sense you know, because it's more welcoming in that way. There's less, you know, reason for confrontation because pretty much y'all see things the same way. <laughs> but are you actually learning anything? So people settle down in communities looking for homogeneity between either culture or religion or belief, and they like that. And typically those people that they surround themselves be go on a list. So we have our family, our parents, our community members, and public figures, for example. Now, if you think about the cinema, or you think about the field of law, for example, is there a lot of diversity there? Haven't we had a lot of struggles when it comes to having cast members not necessarily represent the people that they're playing? So for underrepresented and marginalized groups, the list of people that surround them is rather short because they lack representation. So I believe that in order to change this, we have to start reaching out to people that don't look like us. Because if we don't, then we're never gonna get anywhere in our society. And we're never gonna tap into those resources of information that each person offers us. All right, so from then on, we can look at how racism begins. <laughs> So humans have this innate ability to group things that look like each other together. And instead of analyzing the bigger picture, we, no, no, instead of analyzing the individual pieces, we view the bigger picture because it takes less time. You know, this is known as Gestalt psychology. Now, the beginnings of racism and discrimination start here when we first meet people. When we look at a person, we look at them physically. We think about their hair color, their skin color, eyes, facial features. And from there, we think we can categorize them into certain groups. But if we've never spoken to them or never interacted, how is it that we can put them in a cultural group that we think they belong? A lot of people look at me and they say, she's Hispanic. No. <laughs> I greatly respect that group of people but I'm not them, and I don't want to represent them because I don't know anything about them. So say um, we are observing a person who starts to behave in what we deem in an appropriate manner. Instead of attributing that behavior to that individual, we tend to attribute it to the entire culture. We say, oh, that's just what they teach each other in that, in that, in that aspect, and that's just how it is. That is racism and discrimination beginning. Because an individual represents their experiences and their knowledge, and that's it. Sure, culture has an influence, but that does not mean that that is how they make every decision. So I have a friend who is African American, and she aspires to be a lawyer. Now she looked at the field of law and said to herself, I wanna go into this because I really love law, but there's no one there that looks like me. 
and that deterred her. So let's take that back to the idea of this gestalt psychology and apply that to the professional sense. If an employer has or partakes in some way of discrimination or believes in some stereotypes, that'll affect who they hire. And historically and currently, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, the color of your skin impeded your chances of being hired. So is she so wrong to look at the field of law and say, I feel unwelcomed because there's no one here that looks like me? In this particular case, I encourage dual responsibility because I don't believe that one side should take the burden over the other. In this case, both sides need to recognize that if an area is underrepresented, we collectively need to make an effort to make it more representative. And we've seen a lot of people, a lot of public figures, to be exact, make this effort say that I aspire to be in this field and I'm not gonna have any obstacles stop me from getting there. Martin Luther King Jr., Sandra Day O'Connor, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. They said, you know what? Just because you don't see me here, that doesn't mean I don't belong here. So they shattered the glass ceiling that was set way too low for them. And as a person of mixed race, I respect that. And so should you. So you might say to me, well, Krista, the world isn't that simple. We can't just change things overnight. And I know that. I understand that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Because not every solution that we implement will be the one that takes the cake, but it can be the ladle that stirs the pot and gets things going a little. Confronting issues of racism and discrimination can seem like an intimidating task to execute. And it is, understandably. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And, and these issues that we see in the news, like UC Berkeley or Charlottesville, that just, that just deter us from involving ourselves, shouldn't stop us either. And I want you to look at this, this, this excerpt from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham Jail. He says, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the word of a nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. And neither should we. Please, don't view the issues at UC Berkeley and Charlottesville as one step forward and two steps back, but instead lessons that we still need to learn and obstacles that we must overcome as a society. Also derive three, con three concepts from these incidents. One, do not suppress the beliefs of people that don't believe in the same things as you do. That will only embolden their anger and force them to come up with the fury. Two, teach rather than yell. I mean, if I was standing up here and just yelling things at you, would that be entertaining? No, not at all. And three, understand rather than tolerate. Because you should know the facts and allow yourself to look at it objectively before you put in your subjective bias. You might end up having conversations with people who don't necessarily agree with the same things as you, but having a constructive conversation is better than not. I'm a person of mixed race, and I view the world differently, but I'm not the only one. And I've recognized that our issues come from a lack of cultural awareness and communication. We look at our phones, and we say we know how people feel based on what they post on social media. But do we really, if we don't interact with them? Or we look at ourselves, and we say our issues are illegitimate. Because for people who have been systematically oppressed, those issues are centuries old. So they're just used to it at this point. And that's awful. And sometimes when we try to mediate a situation, we're not entirely confident if our solutions will truly make a difference. So the common thread here is education. And that means to interact with those around you because like I said before, humans are reservoirs of information. They can provide you with a perspective you may have never thought you needed. And I want to give a shout out to um, uh, Dean Scutt, uh, president of Lake Forest College, who 
ex exemplified this very idea. After uh, the emergence of a racially controversial Facebook page, he decided to provide a, a platform for the voices that have been left unheard and suppressed. And that included the very person that designed the page. Because he wanted us to talk about cultural diversity as a community, national growth, and diversity of thought. He and the faculty at this college are examples of how to turn a tough situation into a learning experience. So I urge you, start communicating. Start having conversations with people who don't look anything like you, have the same religion as you, the same skin color, the same perspective or background, because they can offer you something you may have never thought you needed. And you need to involve yourself as well. This, this presumes uh, the idea of give and take. If you have questions, you gotta ask. If you see an issue, you gotta involve yourself. Because if you don't, where are we gonna end up? It's only going to exacerbate the issues that we already have. You have 7.4 billion opportunities to execute this. Go out and seize them.